Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you uh, for joining us in person and remotely. I'm Muri Berberian, a professor of history, uh, and there begins the long uh, titles. Uh, Mehruni Family Presidential Chair in Armenian Studies and Director of the Center for Armenian Studies. On behalf of the center and as a and uh, all our co-sponsors, and as a descendant of the survivors of the Armenian Genocide, I recognize our presence on the ancestral and unceded homeland of the Tanba and Hashemun peoples. We are very excited uh, to bring to, to you an evening of book reading, conversation, and book signing with author Nadia Ousu, facilitated by Dr. Tala Shahinyan and Dr. Gilda Nishang for Bagro. Given the role of earthquakes, tremors, and aftershocks in her life and memoir, we thought it apt to bring her to Southern California. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're very happy that there were none of those <laughs> uh, while she's been here, and we hope that she leaves without any of those happening. Um, either. Uh, this program was made possible by an unprecedented collaboration and co-sponsorship of several partners on campus, and I'm grateful to all of them. Uh, of course, the Center of Ar uh, for Armenian Studies, Illuminations, uh, Humanities Center, Humanities Equity Advisor, and Humanities Climate Council, and the Departments of African American Studies, Comparative Literature, English, and of course, my own year department, History. Uh, I would like to provide a breakdown of this evening uh, before we uh, begin. After my brief introduction, we will first have the pleasure of hearing uh, Nadia read a few excerpts from her book. I will then introduce our panelists, uh, Dr. Shani Yang and Dr. Bourbano, who will provide brief commentary and questions informed by their respective specializations with the goal of uh, simulating the conversation. We will then open the floor for further questions. We will end the evening with a book signing. So if you don't already have the book, they are available here for purchase. So uh, without further ado, please let me begin. First of all, I want to say personally that uh, I just spent a few hours with Nadia and it was um, a wonderful experience. And I'm so happy to have gotten to know her personally after reading uh, her memoir. So I'm delighted to introduce her to you. Uh, Nadia Ousu is a Whiting award-winning writer and urbanist. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times Magazine, Granta, the Paris Review Daily, The Guardian, Bon Appetit, and elsewhere. She is currently working on her first novel. Her debut memoir, Aftershocks, which is the reason why we are here today, was named the best book of 2021 by Time, Vogue, Esquire, NPR, and over a dozen others. It was a New York Times editor's choice pick and one of Barack Obama's favorite books of the year. Many of the themes in Nadia Ousu's aftershocks of identity and belonging of peoples with mixed histories, trying to make sense of the world, the past, and find home spoke to me and I'm sure speak to many of you here. Nadia has created an occasion for Armenian studies, African-American studies, and all of us really to convene as she writes openly with courage and honesty about trauma, her struggles with mental health, and finding home within. So please join me in warmly welcoming her to UCI. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, thank you all for being here uh, in person and on Zoom. I'm assuming it's Zoom. Um, I'm just going to read a few excerpts uh, from my memoir, Aftershocks. I'm going to start with um, the first chapter. It's called First Earthquake. Rome, Italy, age seven. My mother's hair is long, straight, and black. It blows behind her in the wind. She is walking away again. In the moonlight, she is a phantom ship drifting out on obsidian waters toward the place where the sky and ocean meet, disappearing over the curvature of the earth. And the moment is so evanescent, so intangible, that I am already wondering, a wisp of her still in sight, if she was ever there at all. She does not turn to see me in the doorway. 
I am seven years old, bundled up in a pink sweater and down stuffed coat. My bobbled hat pulled down past my eyebrows. My white socks are dingy and damp from the rain that seeped into the black canvas shoes I insist on wearing no matter the weather. I want to call out to her, but I'm afraid that she will not turn around. Or worse, that she will, but still won't choose me. She gets into the passenger seat of the blue Fiat her husband borrowed from an acquaintance. They are passing through Rome for a day on their way back to Massachusetts. They vacationed in Venice. Earlier, before my mother arrived without sign or signal, I woke up to the sound of rain. It was dark outside, so dark I thought it might still be night until I smelled pancakes. My father made pancakes on Saturday mornings. As I ate my breakfast, face buried in a shabby copy of Little Women, my father fretted. He tapped his foot, peeped at his watch, pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose. I wondered what was making him anxious and hoped that whatever it was wouldn't require him to sit at his desk all weekend. He had just returned from a work trip to Dhaka. I wanted him to myself. The radio always perched on the kitchen counter next to the toaster, its bent antenna somehow finding the BBC World Service, brought news of a catastrophic earthquake in Armenia. Tens of thousands of people were killed, hundreds of thousands lost their homes and everything in them. A city called Spitak was destroyed. A new city, the woman on the radio said, would have to be built over the ruins. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev asked the world for help. On my pancake, I spread butter and sprinkled sugar. Does mama have family in Armenia? My father flinched, then looked at me with wide eyes magnified by Coke bottle glasses. No, he said, her family are Armenian, but they lived in Turkey. They're all in America now. We usually avoided the topic of my mother, but the BBC said this was an emergency. Rules are suspended in emergencies. I'm half Armenian, but was not sure if the earthquake had anything to do with me. My Ghanaian father, stepmother Annabelle, sister Yasmin and I live in Italy. This was the first I'd heard of the Caucasus Mountains, the fault rupture point that caused the event. I asked my father what an aftershock was. He said there are tremors in the earth that follow an earthquake. They are the earth's delayed reaction to stress. The doorbell rang just as I was about to go upstairs to brush my teeth. Yasmin, who had stumbled into the kitchen rubbing her eyes, jolted awake and scampered after me to see who it was. We hoped our friends from next door had come to play. Our mother was on the front porch with two red balloons and shaking hands. I stared at her. Remembering my voice, I shouted for my father to come. We hadn't seen my mother in three years, not since I was four. My father nodded hello and sent Yasmin and me to get dressed. When we came downstairs, my parents were still sitting in the hallway. They weren't speaking. My mother's hands were in her pockets. She had let go of the red balloons and they had floated up to the ceiling. Her head dropped. My father's shoulders were drawn back. His legs spread apart. Your mother is going to take you for a drive. My father opened the closet and pulled out our puppy coats. I could feel him on the other side of the front door when he closed it behind us, as though to say he would be there exactly where we left him when we returned. My mother's husband drove, silent while my mother chattered. Our half-sisters were dying to see us. She would bring them next time. Venice was a magical place. She could hardly believe it was real. Our grandparents bought us a kite in the shape of a fish. Our father would show us how to fly it in the spring. Despite the drizzle, my mother's husband dropped us off in Piazza Navona. An artist drew a funny sketch of us together with bulbous heads and startled eyes. We ate at a cafe, plates of spaghetti al pomodoro. All of us requested lots of Parmesan cheese. My mother talked about school and said she liked her house, even though, as far as I knew, she had only seen the hallway. I asked her about the earthquake. She hadn't heard the news. Someday we'll all go to Armenia, she said. It sounded, sounded like half question, half statement, so I said yes, even though I didn't believe her. As we left the restaurant, a juggler swept over, grinning. His hands seemed to barely move, but his blue, yellow, and red clubs hurtled high above his head. He caught two in one hand and one in the other and bowed deep. My mother clapped. Yasmin and I, always tentative around strangers, considered the cracks in the paving stones. My mother pressed a few gold and silver thousand lira coins into the juggler's hand. She also gave one each to Yasmin and me to toss into the Fontana di Quattro Fiumi. 
I told my mother what my father told me about the fountain, about how the four figures in it are the gods of four rivers on four continents, the Nile, the Ganges, the Danube, and the Rio de la Plata. Above the gods is an obelisk topped with a dove. The obelisk represents the Catholic Church. The river gods are powerful, but they prostrate themselves before the Vatican. The fountain is a symbol of colonialism, I whispered, echoing my father, who speaks to me like I was a grown-up. Colonialism, as I understand it, is white people stealing land from black and brown people, white people beating and killing black, black and brown people, white people forcing black and brown people into slavery and servitude. My father, I know, was born in the last year of colonial rule in what was then the Gold Coast. He says being born as Ghana was being born was the beginning of his good fortune, of our good fortune. I liked that my mother laughed and told me I was smart. When I threw my coin into the water, I closed my eyes tight and listened to my mother's laughter sing with the sound of water. That sound was the wish I dared not shape into words because words could be misconstrued. Now I watch my mother get into the blue fiat. Her husband starts the admission. To see her more clearly, I squint. She rests her head against the window, and I imagine, or perhaps hope, she is crying. The car pulls away, absorbed by the night. I sniff the air for exhaust or perfume, for any remnant of my mother's presence, but I smell only wet limestone and garlic. My stepmother Annabelle is cooking dinner. Piazza Navona seems far away now. We live in Eur, a neighborhood known by an acronym, for the Esposizione Universale di Roma, a World's Fair that never happened because of the onset of World War II. Eur was built by Mussolini to celebrate 20 years of fascist Italy and to expand the city to the sea. Unlike the rest of Rome, Eur is an orderly place. Its buildings are solid, polished white, and arranged around a grid of right angles. Usually its predictability makes me feel safe, but now it feels inhospitable, spiritless. Somewhere in the house, my sister shrieks. She does not want to take a bath. Her anger, I know, is about something else entirely. With a last breath, I inhale whatever particles of my mother remain and close the door behind me. In the hallway, I remove my shoes. The marble floor is cold against my thin socks. Above me, the bulb my father keeps forgetting to change flickers from light to dark and light again. Between my thumb and fingers is the Polaroid my father took of my mother Yasmin and me minutes ago. All of us blinked. Later, as I am about to walk into my father and Annabelle's room to say goodnight, I overhear my father venting. She can't even bother to spend time with her daughters, he says. A few hours are all she could spare for them. That's why I didn't even want to tell them she was coming. She's never going to change. He drank a lot of red wine at dinner and his voice is louder than usual. It rises above the hiss of the radiators and the near human yowls of the stray cats that beg under trattoria tables by day and hunt mice in the city's sewer system by night. I knock on the cracked open door and enter, trying to walk normally, resisting running into my father's arms. My lips quiver and I curse them to keep from crying as my father pulls me into a long hug. My head on his shoulder, I nuzzle into the soapy smell of his neck. He holds me like this every night until we vibrate to the same rhythm. Our heartbeats say, he is mine and I am his. He kisses my forehead and reminds me to dream sweet dreams, reminds me that tomorrow will be ours. We can read together all day and maybe in the evening we will listen to high life music and dance in our pajamas. <laughs> These reminders I know are meant as consolation. He wants me to forget my mother was here. The following week, I take the caricature by the artist in Piazza Navona and the Polaroid picture of my mother Yasmin and me to school for show and tell. I do not tell my father. I attend an international school in the Acacia. My classmates are from all over the world, but I am one of only two black students. Sarah Brennan, an English girl with green eyes, wants to know why my mother and I are different colors. There is no malice, only curiosity in her voice, but I feel embarrassed. I can only say, I don't know why. As I return to my seat, my face burns. At lunchtime, Miss Rossi, my teacher, sits next to me and asks if I enjoyed spending time with my mother. Tears pool in my eyes as I nod. She takes me by the hand and leads me into the bathroom where she helps me wash my face. She asks me what is wrong. How do I tell her about the trembling that leads to ripping, then to violent rupture, to whole lives and whole cities disintegrating? 
to piles and piles of rubble, to displacement and exile? How do I tell her that a day that begins with pancakes for breakfast can end in disaster, that in an instant an earthquake or a mother can arrive and change everything? How do I tell her that even when the earth stops shaking, cracks in the surface spread silently, pent up forces of danger and chaos can be unleashed at any time? I don't know how to explain any of this, so I tell her I'm afraid of the aftershocks. I'm going to read one more short, uh, very short chapter. It's called Failures of Language. I do not have my great grandfather's worn but carefully pressed cotton handkerchief. My father's family aren't much for holding on to material things. I do not have my maternal great grandmother's red hair or my paternal grandfather's coffee bean skin. What an unusual combination, people often say when I describe my parentage Ghanaian, Armenian. And more than once, how did that even happen? I speak three and a half languages that do not belong to me, that do not run through my veins. English, Italian, and French, decent Swahili. When my relatives and country people maneuver between English and their home languages, Tri, Armenian, and Turkish, I grip the ropes of the English words as firmly as my jittery hands will allow and loop them into knots. I watch for cocked eyebrows and pursed lips to translate the rest. The warm, round percussion of tree and the orderly harmony of Turkish, which spoken by my family, is diluted with a splash of archaic Armenian and a heavy pour of Boston accent, are familiar but impenetrable. I can spot members of my two disparate tribes in a crowd, but I cannot address them except in basic greeting and pleasantry. Good morning. How are you? Welcome. In tree, I can also say, even the elephant can spot flies with its short tail, and any river loses its identity when entering the sea. My father, when his intention was to remind or chastise, was fond of proverbs and folk tales. The heroes of those tales were animals of the forest, spirits, and gods. I know them by name. My Ghanaian relatives are at times tickled by my inability to speak tree. At other times, they are affronted. How can you not speak your own language, they ask, not acknowledging that my learning it would have required them to teach me. Once when I was in the market with an auntie, I cannot remember which one, a woman asked why no one had taught me to speak my father's tongue. Nobody wants to hear her speaking tree in an American accent, the auntie replied. Since she replied in English, I can only assume she meant for me to understand. <laughs> in tree, I cannot say, love me, accept me, I need you. At 13, I could not ask my father not to die. In Turkish, I know the words for eggplant, yogurt, and savory pastries. The stories of my mother's family are very much concerned with food. What was served, whose dish was tastiest, and delicious gossip, who messed up the baklava. As a child, when I visited them in Massachusetts, we talked about eggplant, wash kebab, and pilaf with little chopped up noodles in it. We planned for dinner as we washed lunch dishes. We ate to remember those who escaped genocide, and nearly starved in the desert to honor what they made possible for us. My grandmother taught me to roll rice and lamb into grape leaves. My mother read to me from 1001 Nights. Ali Baba said, open sesame and discovered a stolen treasure. A genie emerged from a lamp to do Aladdin's bidding. Scheherazade told tales to a king to delay her own execution. Another one, I said to my mother after each story. Tell me another one. I do not know the Turkish word for stay. I cannot say, mama, come back. In Armenian, the language largely lost to my family generations ago in the Ottoman Empire, the only word I know is the word for underwear, varde. This knowledge I cannot explain. When I encounter strangers from my tribes, they are startled by my attempts to communicate. They do not recognize me as one of their own. They laugh, charmed, and perhaps a little disturbed by the discrepancy between appearance and sound. When I explain myself, they think me a curious hybrid. They speak to me always in English. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That gives you a flavor uh, of the memoir if you haven't read it yet. Um, and I hope I hope you will. 
Um, now, I would like to introduce our two panelists uh, and uh, who will give uh, short uh, four to five minute commentaries and um, some questions to get a conversation going. Uh, so first, uh, Tana Shahinya uh, holds a PhD in comparative literature from UCLA and lectures in the program for Armenian studies at UC Irvine, where she also is a visiting faculty uh, in the Department of Comparative uh, Literature. During the next academic year, uh, I am pleased to say she will serve as interim director of the Center for Armenian Studies in my absence while I'm on sabbatical leave. Uh, so she'll be doing what I'm doing uh, now. Uh, her, among other things, of course. Her research interests include world literature, transnationalism, uh, politics of Western Armenian literary history and language, and questions of trauma, aesthetics, and representation. She is the author of Stateless, The Politics of the Armenian Language in Exile, forthcoming with Syracuse University Press, and the co-editor of the collective volume The Armenian Diaspora and Stateless Power, Collective Identity in the Transnational 20th Century, forthcoming with Bloomsbury Publishing. She co-edits Diaspora, a journal of transnational studies, and contributes regularly to the Armenian literary magazine, Hakim. Uh, Inda Nishayim Fondango holds a PhD in African literature. She is a visiting scholar with the Department of Comparative Literature at UC Irvine as well, and a lecturer in the Department of English at University of Bavenda, uh, Cameroon. Her research interests include literature and gender, as well as marginalization studies with an emphasis on the affirmation of female identity. She has published a number of book chapters and articles in journals such as the Hybrid Journal of Literary and Cultural Studies, Steadfast Arts and Humanities, Nairobi Journal of Humanities and Social Sciences, International Journal of Applied Linguistics and English Literature, Journal of Arts and Humanities, and the European Journal of English Language, Linguistics and Literature. So please give them a very warm welcome so thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Is it on? Okay. All right. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much, Nadia, for that wonderful reading and Hori for that introduction. Um, I'm going to begin with my remarks and then I'll pass the mic on to uh, Gilda and then we can get the conversation going. Aftershocks, as the memoir's title suggests, binds together fragments and memories of Nadia Ousu's young life within the powerful metaphor of an earthquake. In it, an older Ousu, a survivor of many foreshocks, main shocks, and aftershocks, weaves together her experiences of loss, mourning, orphanhood, abandonment, mobility, displacement, and the subsequent paradox of home that they engender. In many ways, her story is the story of the 20th and early 21st century human condition. It makes us confront the aftermath of centuries of conquest, violence, and forced exile. What do we do with what is left over, it asks. Where do we go from here? Where do we go when empires crumble, but systems and discourses of oppression remain? What is hauntingly beautiful in Ousu's cyclical narrative is the overlap of her personal journey with the histories of places and spaces she inhabits. Her private life and pain are always integrated within a sphere that is wider, be it the public, the communal, the national, or global. Her traumas are always poised against historical narratives and collective experiences. Life writing, or the memoir genre, asks the writer to turn lived experience into an act that requires witnessing, witnessing from the inside. Ousu as a witness oscillates between this position of being inside an event and being outside an event. In other words, in addition to providing us with an account of her life stories, she's concerned with finding a home for these stories within greater shared experiences, systems of thought, and grand narratives. Her experiences in Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, Ghana are framed within an understanding of post-colonial politics. 
Her experiences with bullying and other transgressions in Italy, England, and the United States configure racism as a transnational phenomenon of white supremacy, both structural and ideological. Her familial experiences of abandonment and orphanhood are also placed within the psychoanalytical discourse of transgenerational trauma that informs the study of the Armenian genocide's aftermath. Her struggles with depression and out-of-placeness are narrated through an intersectional web that accounts for patriarchal framings of the female body, racist framings of skin color, and classist restrictions on access and mobility. The effect of this type of simultaneous micro and macro level mapping that Ousu provides leaves us, the reader, spellbound. Coupled with the non-linearity of her storytelling, the memoir invites our steadfast engagement and investment. We also find ourselves belonging to her story and feel like her narrative voice belongs to us. As the narrator Nadia Ousu longs for belonging, we ourselves recognize that our own search for home is always both futile and perpetual. We find openings in her narrative threads that invite us to bring our own buried traumas to the surface. And toward the end of each chapter, we experience the omnipresent language of vibrations articulated on the printed page, mirrored within us. There was not a single chapter I concluded without physically feeling a tremor rise within me, even when we were reading actually earlier. Toward the end of the memoir, the section entitled Devices compiles both the real and figurative earthquakes of Ousu's life, jumping from literal earthquakes to civil wars she's lived through in Uganda and Ethiopia, to the 9-11 attacks that she's experienced up close, to her own personal losses. She confesses louder than, louder than before that she thinks in seismic terms. She writes, an earthquake is the groundbreaking and the heartbreaking. It is fictional, fictional forces and literary device. While earthquake, both as an, inherently, uh, an inherent earthly phenomenon and as a natural disaster is defined from many angles in the memoir's paratext, this line, coupling frictional force with literary device, struck me and lingered with me for a long time. Ousu's aftershocks, despite all the pain it recounts, is a celebration of the art of writing. Through its subtle, slow building, yet poignant poetics, it reminds us of the power of literature as not only a form of representation, but as an act of claiming agency through language. For me, Nadia Ousu's memoir was not a story of becoming, rather a story of unraveling, a story that privileges processes of working through traumas over the idea of a perfect and complete self, a story that seamlessly connects storyteller, author, and reader by allowing the text to perform and reveal the fluid and porous boundaries of identities we seek to nevertheless limit. Thank you, Sana. Oh, welcome again. <laughs> so um, I will not belabor the point that aftershocks. It's an incredibly moving a memoir, a story of other numerous remarkable stories which border on the life and experiences of Nadia Ousu who has a multiplicity of identities in nature and in nurture. And it is therefore not an easy fit into categorizations. The testimony of this is seen in the numerous breathtaking prayer statements addressing different issues in her memoir. My focus will be on some of those issues handled in the memoir, looking at them from the post-colonial and African appreciation of uh, the memoir. I will start by borrowing a lead from Ashil Mbembe, the post-colonial critic, whose statement in critique of Black reason seems to capture the post-colonial message in aftershocks. He says, I quote, 
For in the end, there is only one world. It is composed of a totality of a thousand parts of everyone, of all worlds. It is therefore humanity as a whole that gives the world its name. So we see that post-colonialism encourages a multiplicity of views and not universalism, which ends of most of the time being American centrism or Eurocentrism. And imposing post-colonial lesson drawn from the memoir aligns with what Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie refers to uh, the danger of a single story, danger of a single truth in a multicultural and multifaceted world as ours. Also, being a hybrid of a Ghanaian father and Armenian American mother, is privileged to have lived in many places. There is a quotation from the text which really struck me. She says, I'm quoting from the text. I loved growing up in many countries, among many cultures. It made it impossible for me to believe in the concept of supremacy. It deepened my ability to hold multiple truths at once, to participate and nurture empathy. And what is truth? We sometimes say truth is reality. And uh, the memoir makes us understand that there is no one reality because reality is the world with its different cultures, different experiences. So the different parts of the memoir seems to be a symbolic message of the parts that make the whole, the human story, which is not single, but multifaceted and should be seen as such for peaceful coexistence in society. She therefore denounces the one truth syndrome that generally or sometimes characterize Western thought and theorizing. So the message could be viewed from the following proverb. Let the hawk perch, let the eagle perch, and I can add, let every other bird perch, and whoever doesn't want the other to perch, let its wing dislocate. <laughs> from the African post-colonial perspective, we are going to, uh, in the course of the discussion, look at uh, culture, oral literature, and education. We can talk about racism, slavery, colonialism, and ensuing consequences like inferiority, superiority complexes, trauma, identity crisis, and belonging, language, uh, just to name this. So um, I have a few questions here for you, uh, Nadia. We are going to discuss as we move along. But the first issue that I want to talk about is uh, history. Uh, I understand that history occupies a huge portion in your memoir. And you so beautifully, beautifully weave the different histories in the story, connecting, for instance, though uh, at different points of the memoir, slavery to colonialism, to independence movements, to post-independence leadership. And you seem to do so, so effortlessly, which is really great. I really appreciate that. One thing uh, too is that history, as we know, it seems to have been written. So what in essence are you doing? Are you writing these stories or are you rewriting these stories? So maybe you'll tell us a little bit about that. And um, still on that, uh, your, your, your life seems to connect with all these histories and shape in most instances who you are and who you have become. I don't know if that is true. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. So attentively, it really means a lot to me. So thank you both. Um, yes, I think uh, history, the project of this book for me, and it started as a private project. I actually wasn't thinking of writing it as a book necessarily in the beginning. And the goal of the private project where I was sort of pulling together a mix of sort of um, more kind of memoir writing that was more about my life and then doing a lot of research and writing a lot of um, 
sort of essays, I guess you could call them, about the history of the places and the people that I've lived among and, and belonged to. Um, and the, the, the kind of question that I was exploring through that work was sort of where do I fit into the histories of the cultures that I ostensibly come from, but for much of my life have felt so disconnected from. And so in some ways I was trying to narrate myself into that history and to contextualize these more intimate stories of my life um, through a deeper understanding of the places and people and cultures that I come from. And that, you know, once you sort of find one thread, I think unravel is a very good word, like everything starts to come apart. And it was also to kind of connect to another part of your question in terms of writing or revising. One of my struggles, particularly in writing um, about African history, is that much of what was available in the archive in the United States is written from a white and Western and European colonial perspective. And so it was very difficult for me to find sources that actually uh, connected with my experience of the places that I came from and the stories that I had been told by my elders. Um, I didn't recognize those stories in a lot of the sources. And so that was a struggle for me. And I realized that actually part of my project had to be not just to write the history so that I could more deeply understand them um, because of that sense of disconnection, but also to revise those histories so that they better represented um, the stories that I had been um, given in bits and pieces throughout my life. And so I think revision um, and, and revisionist history is a project that I'm really interested in, not in the sense of sort of like, we all get to just have our own facts, but more in the sense of sort of um, reclaiming stories that have been stolen um, you know, from us and to write them in a way that honors the realities of you know, the, the people and places that come. And then if I could approach Gilda's question from a slightly different angle, um, she's raising the question of um, the, you know, the, not necessarily the tension, but really the, the really nicely complemented personal narratives with the historical narratives and your work's relationship with the archive and what's been written before. On the other hand, if we dig deeper into the personal uh, narratives, we're uh, we have to kind of ask about your work's relationship with memory, your own memory, and your family's memory. The memoir genre demands a certain pact with the idea of truth. You know, when as readers we pick up a memoir, or something, you know, I think it's on the cover, right? A, a memoir. Um, what we're expecting is that um, what we're about to read is a true story. It happened to it's it, it happened as such to the author. Um, we also know that when it comes to experiences, the way things are remembered can produce different versions depending on who's remembering and when they're remembering. Um, and then to add to that, if we're talking about experiences that are particularly painful or traumatic, um, there's also issues of uh, traumatic memory and faulty memory and, and, and revision with you know, the process of memory. So could you talk about um, what the act of writing a memoir entails or entailed for you? Um, if, the, if there were gaps in memory, how do you go about closing them? Um, um, what is lost and what is gained when uh, you're bringing your own past uh, to, to language? Mm -hmm. That's such a great question and one I thought about a lot um, as I was writing and actually sort of, um, you know, there, there was a mentor of mine who, who says often that the, um, the problem with the essay can become the subject of the essay, right? And so for me, that was true in a lot of ways in that, you know, the, the, the sort of problem of the ways in which our memories are fallible and the ways in which, you know, I know my own memory is, is prone to imagination. Um, and also, you know, I, I was reading somewhere that, um, you know, the more you tell a story, the less true it becomes because you sort of color it as in the telling. Um, and so in the telling, you're sort of, you get further and further away from the truth. And so many of the stories that are most important to us, the ones that stand out that we remember, that we've told so many times, um, it's really difficult at a certain point to know, like to what extent this is, well, and also the, the idea of sort of objective truth is tricky, right? Because people can understand 
a certain situation from multiple different perspectives, what you recall of the situation, like all of those, uh, my recollection, my sister's recollection, both of those might be true, but we're retaining a different sense of the truth, as different, we're ascribing different meanings to the truth. And so I'm interested in all of that. I don't have sort of like a very strong ideology. You know, I'll hear some memoirs say, if you don't remember it exactly like that, if you don't remember the color of your mother's dress on that Tuesday, then you can't, you, you shouldn't write it. But for me, you know, some of that sensory detail that sort of that, that stays with you in the mind, whether or not it's true, that is how we experience reality. It is how we experience life. We hold on to those things. Um, and also, I want I wanted to like name that that's what I was doing, and I wanted to name the ways in which somebody else remembered something differently from me, and what does that mean that we ascribe different meanings to the stories of our life. And I wanted to really engage with that question on the page um, and, and be truthful about the ways in which, you know, we, we all invent stories for ourselves. We invent useful stories for ourselves. And some of the project of the memoir was on doing some of the stories that I believed were useful to me, but actually had been doing me harm for a long time. Because a lot of those stories, those sort of harmful stories, um, I needed to rewrite them in the same way that I needed to revise this history. And so I was interested in all of those questions. I, I, I was interested in sort of poking at them and prodding them. And I wouldn't say that I came to definitive answers, but, um, but yeah, the, the, this question of sort of uh, memory and how we um, experience memory and hold on to memory is very, is very central to the project. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, there's one portion of the memoir that really catches my attention, which is the reference to the Anansi oral tales. You know, um, history sometimes tells us that uh, Africa did not have a culture before colonialism. Now, um, we have somehow promoted that colonial agenda because sometimes I get to get into class and I ask, what is literature? And students will tell me it's a work of art written in every selected language and all of that. They don't talk about the oral aspect. But when we look at the Anansi oral tales, we see that the, 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 the constitute a part of Ghanaian literature. You know, this, um, this Anansi story seemed to be saying that Africa had a living, fictive tradition, an educational model, and a culture before the coming of the, the, the colonialists. I don't know whether that is what you're saying. Yes, <laughs> that, that's absolutely what I'm saying. And, it, you know, I was, I, I grew up with those stories, um, as most Indian children do. We grow up with those stories. They're sort of morality tales, you know, they're designed to teach us about the world um, and our place in it and how to be in relationship with others. And, and so, you know, I hadn't thought about them in a long time, but I went back and sort of revisited some of those, those stories. And, you know, there are collections of them that exist. Some of them have been written into children's books. But then I wanted to more deeply understand sort of the role of storytelling in Ashanti culture. And this is true of many African cultures, uh, pre-colonial African cultures, and continues to be true in many African cultures, the role of oral storytelling. Um, in our cultures, and the role of music is very similar in that those things are not separate. You know, often in the Western world, the role of the artist is um, the artist is often positioned as someone sort of on high with all of these talents, and it's sort of a way to separate ourselves from from community. Whereas in in many African cultures and these storytelling traditions, the role of the artist is part of the culture. It's embedded in the culture. We experience art in our day-to-day -day lives. There are, there are songs for washing clothes. There are songs for going on walk. There are songs for, um, for flirting, you know, and dances for all of those things. There are stories that are told on particular, for particular festivals um, or in particular moments of people's lives. And it's really embedded in the culture. And so I was wanting to learn more about that tradition and that history 
um, and which is literature and is sort of the seeds of those stories and so much of the African literature that I love even today, you can see them. And then I also, you know, sort of learned that the Anansi stories actually are told um, in different versions. Some of the characters have changed a little bit um, and the settings have changed, but they're told on the islands of the Caribbean. And you can still recognize, you know, Anansi is still present, which means that those, so Anansi is a trickster spider. And he's still present in those stories in the Caribbean, which means that those stories survived the Middle Passage. And to me, that is so miraculous that this culture this oral storytelling tradition is so powerful that it sustained people through the horrors of enslavement um, in, in a similar way that um, the roots of jazz, like um, if, you, if you listen to the rhythms in, in kind of early jazz and the roots of jazz, you can hear Ashanti rhythms, which makes sense, you know, because those rhythms also survived the Middle Passage and then were reinvented in a new world. And, you know, as someone who's interested in diaspora, even when your history is sort of stolen from you, as is the case with, you know, Black Americans in this country, the, the stories and the rhythms, the art, you know, sustained people across generations. And um, that to me was really powerful and meaningful and spoke to the fact that African literature existed before colonization. Thank you, thank you, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. All right. and, and, you know, I would also, as you were talking, I would also argue that there's a certain sense of orality in your own storytelling. Uh, the question I was about to ask uh, next had to do with the, the chapter called Fault Zone Voice, where you pay so much attention to uh, you get us to pay attention to the sound of your voice, our authors, our narrator's voice, and that it has evolved um, throughout the years. And, you know, uh, in turn, we start paying attention to, to, you know, our own evolution of sound and voice. Um, earlier, you read the chapter about language, languages disappearing in the case of the Armenian lost to your uh, grandparents' generation in the Ottoman Empire how languages travel and how you react to languages can hear and feel at home, et cetera. Um, in this particular, this is this, I mean, this is, it's a, you know, it's hard to pick a favorite, but I think this, this chapter, I really, really loved the fault zone voice chapter. Um, in it, if I could just, you know, reveal a few things, uh, a, a former boyfriend sees a video clip of Nadia from it as a child, and uh, in it, she has a British accent from what I understand, yes. And this is something that, you know, really trips him up. And, you know, he, and um, the, the, you know, he, he asks when, when it changed, when your voice has changed, he says, did it change who you are in some fundamental way? And in parenthetical uh, uh, remarks, we have our narrator say, almost certainly, yes, our voices, I think, are not just the vehicle through which we express ourselves, but also affect how we process and translate the world, how our dreams um, are, are made. And you will go on to talk about code switching, um, something, uh, uh, something I'm sure a lot of us can relate to, those of us who live in multiple languages um, at the same time. Um, and I think, if I'm remembering correctly, at some point you say you dream in the American voice, um, which got me thinking um, in this particular chapter, what voice do you write in? And are there different voices, the voice that speaks and the voice that writes, the, on the, other, the voice that appears on the printed page? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so, Yes, I do think, you know, I, I think I write in the book, but, or if I don't, then I, I believe it, um, that, that I have retained, you know, the different voices that I've spoken and they do live inside of me and those rhythms, the rhythm of the language lives inside of me. And so sometimes when I'm writing, I, I do become attuned to a particular rhythm. You know, if I'm writing, for example, about Tanzania, sort of the, the rhythm of English in which Tanzanians speak it does come back into my body and I'm able to access it. So even though I'm writing in English, I'm able to sort of capture the sort of wordplay and the spirit um, with which, you know, different people speak the language. And now I'm, I'm working on a novel and I found sort of the, the voice of my narrator 
um, at, at one point sort of slipped into a more kind of uh, an accent or a language that was more familiar to like my former English accent, mm -hmm. which I lost, I think around you know, seven or eight. Um, I spoke with a British accent until then. And then before that I had a Tanzanian accent because I was, I was born in Tanzania. Um, so I think all of those voices do still live in me. And I can, you know, as people who speak many languages, you, you can access those voices. Um, and I think that that is one of the things that I love so much about writing is to try and sort of find different rhythms um, within language and the different ways in which people from different cultures use the same words um, and the different meanings that they give to them. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yes, awesome. yes, away from that, uh, from writing, you know, um, in the memoir, we see that uh, language and accents play a significant role in identity formation in uh, you know the different context. So uh, among these the functions of language and accents uh, belonging. Now can you can you tell us about how language and accent you know affected your belonging or not belonging in particular uh, Context, particular communities, societies. Yeah, um, sure. I mean, I think I think um, I've experienced belonging and unbelonging because of the way that I speak, and then I've also been able to sort of move back and forth, you know, with code switching between different vocal rhythms and different um, different ways of sort of um, communicating through language. I think several stories that stand out to me, you know, for example. Um, you know, everyone in my father's family is speaking Shindana. Most people speak English, um, but then people also speak Pidgin, which is sort of like a more playful form of English. Um, and a lot of sort of um, the sort of more uh, casual sort of joking around life happens in Pidgin, which I don't have access to. I can't speak Pidgin. And so I'm sort of, I, I can understand some of it, you know, but I'm sort of on the outside of that. I can't participate. Um, in, in that way. And, and similarly, you know, as with many languages, with people who are um, and have for generations who have been multilingual, the moving back and forth between tree and English, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult for me to sort of keep up. Um, and and I'm, so I'm sometimes left out of, of those sorts of conversations with my family. And then um, similarly, sort of the, the, with the Armenian side of my family, um, you know, everyone speaks English and mostly speak English. You know, for the most part, when, when they're communicating with one another, they speak in English. Um, and so I definitely do have access to that. They also speak with very thick Boston accents. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I also, you know, because I don't have a Boston accent, then it's clear, you know, the extent to which sort of like, are you part of this group? You know, like um, language plays a part in that to just the, the sort of way of speaking. In other ways, you know, the, the way that I sound has comes with an immense amount of privilege. You know, I arrived in this country, I had not lived here until I was 18 years old, but I arrived in this country sounding like this. And so for me as a, as a black person, as an immigrant, there was a way in which sort of my access to sort of standard American English and, and specifically not black vernacular, um, gives me access um, to, to privileges in ways that other people might not. And I've noticed that particularly in the workplace. Um, I've had sort of colleagues, very brilliant colleagues who speak sort of in black vernacular English, who've gotten sort of feedback from, um, from su supervisors that, you know, you're not polished and those sorts of things. And the opposite is often said of me. And it's a matter, it's a matter of language. It's a matter of sort of what is, ascribed, the meaning that is ascribed to a particular way of speaking English. Um, and then, you know, in the UK, I still, you know, I went to boarding school in England and I, I can still access my British accent. And so, you know, I'm able to sort of fit in and move back and forth um, in the UK. Um, and especially as a child, I don't do that so much anymore. But as a child, you know, when I would go and visit a lot of my cousins, um, live in London, and so when I was, would hang out with them, I was able to sort of communicate with them into British English. Um, I don't really do that anymore because I think 
um, you get more self-conscious about that sort of code switching mm -hmm. after a certain age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think Gilda brought us to the, you know, the, the, the over the arcing theme of the book, which is um, issues of belonging, um, looked at from multiple uh, multiple angles, and um, I'm wondering if we can uh, touch on this a little bit more um, by thinking about how. Um, the, the the memoir you in the memoir you use the language of claiming um, um, quite frequently um, or maybe cyclically actually and um, and uh, there was a scene where one of your friends on a night out in New York uh, tells you you know good night and she says your name and um, you have this beautiful line about it lingering in the air and it's almost like in that in that passage, you come to the, the name as the name is taking shape. Um, and, and it's like it, it was sort of like an act of claiming. Um, there's also lines about, you know, uh, Anna, uh, Annabelle claiming your stepmother claiming you and, and things like that. Um, and so one of my, my, my big questions as I was reading is this idea of belonging and whether there were any hierarchies in belonging to a space, to spaces to call home, belonging to people in your life, belonging to certain communities, larger collectives, uh, belonging to language, corporeal belonging, belonging to a name. I mean, this is this, it, you know, you, you come at it from so many angles. Um, I don't know if, if that's something you want to take on? I know it's a really big yeah, kind of, it's more commentary than, than a question, but it, is there any kind of hierarchy? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think because I grew up the way that I did, moving around so much, um, and I, I always had the sense that no place would ever belong comfortably to me, and I would never belong comfortably to any place. Like, that, that was very clear to me from a very young age. And I think that that's part of why I sought belonging in other ways, you know? And so um, I think belonging to people became really important. And particularly because I had lost already, I had lost a mother, you know, my mother left when I was two. And so the, the notion that sort of uh, family is impermanent and that you might not be claimed or that you might sort of lose um, that those relationships and that sense of belonging was always sort of a sense of danger in my life. And so I was always sort of looking for ways to ingratiate myself. I was always sort of following, you know, mannerisms and very observant about sort of how I was supposed to behave in a particular setting um, and, and sort of hard on, on myself about getting that right to um, and I'm still sort of, I have the, that kind of self-consciousness. I think it's very common um, in people with those sorts of experiences, um, which, you know, in some ways uh, I, I see as, as like a beautiful thing because um, that desire to belong also means that I have cared for things and loved things mm -hmm. very deeply, that like feeling that you might always lose them mm -hmm. um, has made me sort of very passionate about the, the people in my life and very curious about them and sort of observant of them. And, um, and on the other hand, it is connected to sort of that, that fear of losing people. And so people, I think, although I did, I did sort of um, in, in many uh, stages in my life sort of wish for like a home and a and a place to belong to. But if, if I were to sort of rank those things, um, belonging to people sort of is the, the most important thing. And then of course, belonging to people is so wrapped up in all of these other questions of identity, mm -hmm. of language, you know, I've spoken to, you know, feeling sometimes outside of my family because of language, questions of language, um, not looking like either side of my family. Um, and so a sense of sort of being visually sort of uh, easily pegged as an outsider um, in many ways too. So all of those things are very sort of tied up. But if I were to sort of think about what was my deepest desire, always it would be people. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the quest uh, to belong, somewhere in the story, when you are in boarding school in England, 
you try to push to marginalize the other black student. Now, if you were to rewrite the story, or if you were to relieve those moments, how would your relationship be with that other black student? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the reason that it was, that's a really great question. So there's a, there's a, um, a chapter in the book where I sort of explore my experience of being in boarding school. And um, I use that story as a way to sort of look, examine sort of questions of colorism even within the black community, as well as sort of racism and white supremacy. Those things, of course, are deeply connected. You know, the more access that you have, to whiteness, whether it's sort of in the lightness of your skin or the way that you sound or, you know, all sorts of things that, you know, people, you know, I often think about sort of the way that the world has set up, is set up, is such that often, like, Black people are at the bottom of the ladder and then everyone else is sort of scattered along the, uh, the, the rungs and then white people are at the top and we're sort of set up to scramble, you know, as high up to the top as we can get and throw other people off if we have to. And that's a terrible system. It's a really terrible, destructive system. And, you know, as a child, I was somewhat aware of it. You know, I understood the ways in which my sort of white adjacency and access to whiteness um, in this particular environment, in this very posh boarding school in England, was going to buoy me and protect me in ways that it wasn't this other um, African girl. And so rather than, even though I knew that it was wrong, rather than sort of aligning myself with her, I aligned myself with the, the white girls who bullied her. And it was important to me to tell that story because I feel practicing self-accountability had to be part of the work of writing this memoir that if I was going to undo stories in the world and revise them, I also had to take a good look at the ways in which I had been complicit in them. Right. And that that was, that was important to hold myself accountable. Um, but if I were to, of course, if I, if I were to go back in time, um, I think I would have, I would tell, if I were able to talk to young Nadia, you know, and go back in time, I would tell her to knock it off and stuff, you know, like <laughs> to, do things, to do things differently. I think we're going to turn to the audience for some, some questions with our remaining time. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a question here from a remote audience, but since you guys are here, let's take some from you first. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, you know, I was just looking to the point that you're talking, and you know, here we are in America today, and we talk about statues, we put the flags, we erect it, the slavery museum. But my concern still is the classic fiction that's forced upon the kids for the last 70 years. Oh, my God, my children are reading the same. So I was subjected to, and though there's no national standards, regionally, the school districts are assigning the same stuff, Scarlet Letter, Old Man and Sea, Little Homeward Angel, Resident, Great Gatsby. When do you think there's going to be space for satanic verses, or House for Mr. Vismas, or the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks? When will your worst become forced reading? And that same story, same story, Scarlet Letter, the infidelity in that, and Great Gatsby, to me, it's the same story. I don't want children to have to read that. But what standard is that? It's a colonial standard. I'm rejected. I also reject it. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, we're in a place, well, I guess we can look at it in, in a glass half full and glass half empty sort of thing. I think that there has been a, a, a fight um, and continues to be a fight um, towards exactly what you're saying. Um, and, you know, there is, uh, as that sort of fight picks up, there is staunch resistance to it. And so we're seeing that, you know, we were talking earlier today, I have a friend who writes young adult books. She's been writing young adult books for 20 years. And now five of her books have been banned in multiple states. And they've been banned because they have queer characters in them, <laughs> coming of age um, queer characters. 
And so we are in this moment where not only are our curricula sort of like uh, telling the same story over and over again and not including diverse voices, but they're actually actively trying to ban um, other versions, you know, other stories, multiple truths. Um, and, and yet there are, there is a strong movement to sort of try and, and push against that and to insist um, on, on multiple truths and, and, and multiple stories. There's like the own voices movement that's happening in the literature now. And, um, so I'm very interested in that conversation, but at the same time, I share your frustration that it seems like the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for this beautiful presentation. I have a question about rituals and welcoming youths um, and this notion of belonging to people. Um, and I don't know, life is so precious and so unpromised. And, and I kind of want to hear from both of the presenters, like, where do you, how do you allow Nadia to belong to you? Um, like in this moment, like right now, like how how does this book how does this book land in your hearts so that she can belong to you forever? Um, that that's what I, I'd like to hear from you all. <laughs> how does she belong to you? Because I want to make sure that she belongs to you. Um, really powerful question. Um, and I, I tried to kind of hint at that in, in my uh, earlier remarks um, of those moments of arrival um, where I felt like the voice was mine and I belonged to the story um, at the same time. And it's also kind of embedded actually in that answer, which is brewing, is embedded in the, the um, language of claiming that I brought up because I was talking about, I was thinking about and reading this whole thing. Um, I mean, if we also think about it, not just personally, but in the, the spaces we occupy, the disciplines in which we write, speak, produce work, um, the institutions to which we belong and create space. And so I was thinking about hosting this event, the Armenian Studies program hosting the, the event, which is sort of an act of claiming um, in, in many ways, or you know, who all of these, the, the, the sponsors are sort of doing an act of claiming on an institutional level to say, this is our story too. Uh, this represents our story too. Um, but on, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the personal level, there are so many ins, there are so many openings in the memoir that not just me, I think any reader can sort of do that, 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 uh, that act. Uh, as a, as a, uh, uh, an Armenian, I can, you know, sort of go, if I dive into the other personal, as an Armenian who grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, um, in, a, in a room shared with my grandparents, who were both orphans of the Armenian genocide, who has made the trek here and has, has to sort of um, um, reclaim her identity in this particular space in a completely new language, uh, who has to sort of go back and forth and, and you know, uh, in multiple languages, not just Western Armenian, the standard Western Armenian dialect, Western um, English, the Arabic, the Turkish that kind of came to my parent, grandparents and to me. I mean, this, 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 this the, the story really, um, um, really, I think, spoke to me personally. But I also think what is powerful about this narrative is it's it, it the way it's structured to allow for these kinds of earthquakes to, ha to happen in all of the, the, the readers. Um, and it's really that beautiful interplay between the, the, the personal voice and the historical narratives that you go back and forth into that allow for these openings, um, I think for any reader. Is uh, being from uh... Just what you said, uh, Tara. I think there is no way that you when you read these aftershocks and you will not find yourself in it. One way or the other, you're going to see yourself in the text. Because like I said before, it's 
a story of so many remarkable stories. Personally, I can find myself in so many of the issues that are raised in this text from an African perspective, an African reader, an African scholar. There is a lot, especially with the, with, with, with the research that she, she does. And we find that very evident in the text. We take, for instance, the issue of slavery, where she presents a very balanced picture of it. Of course, Africans are responsible for that, but who takes the larger part of the blame? Even if there is a larger part of the blame, there is the other side. Because we have seen that, although we've talked about, we've continuously talked about uh, maybe slavery, who was responsible for it, that portion of Africans being responsible has not really been considered. And that is why if we are talking today about maybe uh, bringing back African-Americans to Africa, then it's, that there is supposed to be something. We are supposed to, first of all, acknowledge that. And it's that failure to acknowledge that is, you know, that is, it is hiding somewhere and it's making that, it is creating that gap and that gap needs to be, you know, closed. We talk about issues of colonialism, about post-independence leadership, you know, we, we, we look at the leadership, where is it coming from? We are all, we, we, we all experience, or we all have experiences. I mean, Africans or us coming from Africa, I coming from Cameroon. Cameroon is, you know, in, in a very chaotic state now because of the colonial legacy. And we, if, if you read this memoir, you go back to the colonial legacy, you see who the, 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 the post-independence leaders were. Who were they? Where did they come from? So when I read this text, I find myself in it. There is no African that will read this text, or let me say a sub-Saharan African that will read this text and will not be able to identify with the text. And then looking at Nadia, how does she belong? Nadia is a hybrid. I don't know if to call hybrid or multiple breed. She's just everywhere. And it's about acceptance. Like I said in that proverb, let the hawk perch, let the eagle perch, let every other bird perch, and whoever doesn't want the other to perch, let its wing dislocate. So that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. Thank you. Um, I'd like to maybe take the question from the remote audience. Uh, so, um, thank you for this outstanding event and work. I have to read that part. Uh, could you please speak to how reclaiming multiple histories and identities through the writing process has transformed traumatic experiences into empowerment from the margins? How do we transform pain into speech and power? To put it differently, how do we speak back to speak back? That's such a great question, and, and really is sort of the um, that is that is sort of I think the central question of this book and likely of my work. Um, I I think often of sort of the ways in which we. Have, many of us have been, you know, our stories have been mistreated in so many ways. Like even thinking about sort of the uh, the the history of the Armenian genocide and just how absurd it is that it was, you know, last year I think or the year before. I don't know how time is working now with the pandemic, but that the United States, you know, uh, the president of the United States finally acknowledged the genocide and to think about sort of what it took to come to this point. And, and what it means to carry a contested history in your body after sort of a um, sort of an exile and displacement and you know massacre, and then to have your story to, to have your story be contested time and time again, um, and what that means, you know, generation after generation. Um, uh, and and similarly, sort of with the other side of my family, you know, I was talking about sort of the ways in which African history is largely told from the colonizer's perspective. 
um, and what that means for Africans who even in Africa, you know, you go to your history class and there is your textbook that comes from England, you know, and, <laughs> and with the story of your people, you know, and it, it undoing that is a big project for me, that, that sort of act of claiming and trying to tell a new story for myself, a story that I can live in, because the one that I have been given is often inhospitable to me and to sort of create space for interrogating and constantly revising and finding new ways um, to understand the world and my place in it and to find new meanings um, to these stories as well. Um, that, that I think is something that I do in my writing, but it's also something I try to do in my life. Um, and I think that more of us need to be sort of interrogating the stories that we've been given because there's so many toxic stories out there that we believe and we carry in our bodies and that make us sick. And, um, and so I think whether or not you're writing, sort of like being attentive to the stories that you've been drinking, you know, from the groundwater from, you know, when you were a <laughs> child um, and, and sort of asking yourself, like, what else might be true that I'm not thinking about? <clears throat> There is one last uh, issue I like uh, maybe uh, to talk about. You know, from uh, your identity struggles at Quest for Belonging, you gradually move towards healing and wholeness, captioning one of the last chapter's libation. You know, that chapter is so emotionally moving and nostalgic for me as an African. You continuously say you pour libation on this or that person, in a way saying you attack this or that person. So I want to find out what, why you decided to use that style. Why did you use that style? It's, it's, it's so great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I was, I was thinking sort of about ceremony and the reasons that we have ceremony. And, and you know, I was thinking about the ways in which ceremony Ceremonies are often sort of uh, our way of sort of coming together and connecting, remembering, uh, grieving, celebrating, like we have ceremonies for all of those things. And so as I was thinking about sort of coming to a place of sort of acceptance of myself, and that's an ongoing project, um, it's, not, it's not clean and neat and there's no bow, but at the same time, the act of pouring libation is a way of showing, expressing gratitude um, for, for ancestors, for the people who came before us. And so I wanted to sort of write that ceremony. I wanted to sort of claim that ceremony um, in a way that's sort of uh, claiming a tradition that, that I have often felt disconnected from and saying, no, this tradition can also be mine. And through practicing this tradition that I'm also honoring my ancestors on all sides of my family and sort of remembering the sacrifices that they made to, to get me to this point where, you know, I'm able to reckon with those difficult things, but also find beautiful new ways of going on into the world. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, there are lots of questions, but I'm afraid it's, I don't want to tire you because you also have a book signing, a book signing to do. Uh, so I'm going to apologize to the uh, remote audience. Uh, perhaps they can write to you. Sure. So you can write to her. <laughs> you can write to her. I'm sorry. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for joining us remotely. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I am so grateful uh, to uh, uh, the panelists for their amazing commentary and questions. And so ever grateful to you, Nadia, for joining us. Um, and uh, please um, join me in thanking you.